The Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday of this institute are devoted to the specific topic areas, and today is the nanotechnology day. Now, when Dane and Rebecca were distracted by other intentions, I also managed to sneak a nanotech thing in on Friday as well. <laughs> so uh, you'll actually get a little bit more nanotech at the end of the week. But this is the nanotech day, um, and with each of the topic areas, we wanted to have one eminent scientist come in and one eminent social scientist or humanist come in, and um, I just can't tell you how lucky I feel about the two people that we managed to get in to talk about now. Okay. Um, I was kind of jumping around for joy when they both said yes. Um, and this afternoon, I'll, I'll be very happy to introduce Rosalind Byrne, who's here, uh, ready to go on the social science and humanities side of things. Um, but this morning, it's Vicky Colvin. Uh, who's coming back to Montana. She came last year uh, for this event. We had a great time. Really got a lot out of her talk. Um, Vicki Colvin's been at Rice since 1996 in the Department of Chemistry and Chemical Engineering. And for a number of years, and I forgot how many years now have you directed CBEN? Seven. Seven years been the director for the Center for Biological and Environmental Nanotechnology at Rice which really has been the premier institute uh, or center that is looking into the biological and environmental effects uh, of nanotechnology. And you know, one of the things that we've already been discussing in our small group is, on the one hand, there's always excitement about nanotechnology, and on the other hand, there's always fears. Um, and CBAN is really the place you would go to if you wanted to sort of get some data on whether those fears were uh, appropriate or could be substantiated uh, or something like that. Um, Dr. Colvin is also the co-director of the Richard E. Smalley Institute for Nanoscale Science and Technology. She said, oh, don't mention that, it's not a big deal. But it sounds kind of like a big deal since uh, Richard Smalley was the guy who discovered buckyballs, right? Um, and when you go to their website, uh, there's a little tag that says, to enter the site, click on the buckyball. So I thought that was kind of neat. Um, this time last year, when we were getting ready for this institute, I picked up National Geographic, uh, and there was an article on nanotechnology, and on about the second or third page of that article, Vicky Colvin was quoted uh, talking about the possible effects of nanotechnology. So we're pretty privileged to have her here speak to us this morning. Um, we have about an hour and 50 minutes, and what I suggested is that Vicky gives her talk for the first 45 to 50 minutes, and we break, maybe you have a couple of questions, but we break, and then we come back really for the question and answer session. So we'll plan on following that model, uh, and I'll turn it over to Vicky Colvin. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here, to see all of you young scientists, social scientists, humanists, however you define yourself. And it's always useful for, for me to get a sense of the audience. So how many of you are scientists, engineers, chemists, physicists, okay, greater than last year. How many of you are social scientists? Any humanists? I don't know what to call humanities. Is humanist the word? You guys are, is that? Okay, <laughs> if, uh, yeah, I don't know exactly where the break is. Okay, great. So um, what I'm gonna do today is, is take a little bit more of a personal uh, story. All of you are, are young intellectuals. You are rising in your fields and you've taken your time out of your schedules to come here and think about the complexities of doing science and technology in society from whatever angle you choose. And I really am glad you're doing it. It's something I wish I would have done when I was younger. Uh, so what I'm going to do, I thought I would share with you, is how I kind of arrived at thinking about technology and, and becoming aware of some of the challenges as a, as a scientist or as a technologist is probably how I brand myself now, looking to try to you know, make the world a better place. I hate to say it, say it, it sounds so trite, 
But I do think that's what motivates a lot of us in this area. And how you very quickly confront some of the larger issues associated with how society and people make decisions uh, and, and how they look at the world around them, especially when scientific data is involved. So I'll sort of take you through that. It'll be a little bit more personal, which I hope you don't mind. It might keep you a little bit more awake at night in the morning. Um, and we'll be happy to I'll be happy to take questions during my talk and we'll also have time afterwards so if you have questions that you want to chat about or issues please you know feel free to raise them and this is supposed to be pretty informal hopefully we'll engage you okay so I decided for a Center for Ethics kind of thing I had to put I didn't want to use the word ethics because I actually don't know what that means I don't know how to define it hopefully you guys are learning that this week but I did decide that the word good um, was maybe touching on ethical issues. So the title is Creating Good Nanotechnology. I think all of us who try to make the world a better place try to do good work, do something that actually makes the world better. And that's where the complexity rises is what that means. Um, so I'll sort of take you through nanotechnology as an example and hopefully it will be relevant to the other topical areas you're studying as well. Um, one of the features of nanotech is it's an emerging technology, which means it's young. It hasn't been around for decades and decades it's emerging both socially as well as sort of in a practical sense and I think that emerging technologies that are just being born share a share a common set of social issues um, that hopefully you guys are talking about and I'll discuss some of those issues with nanotech um, so as you already heard I direct a center so I'll talk a lot about a lot of research from there so really my three objectives let's see if this thing works these are the boring objectives um, <laughs> I want, to, I want to make sure if you don't know nanotech that you learn a little bit about what nanotech is uh, because one of the issues when you delve into any question of is technology a good thing, how are you going to bring it into society, is it, is it something we want or don't want, you actually do have to confront some of the specific technical issues that are unique to every discipline and nanotech has its own quirks that actually make it different than biotech or other topical areas. Um, I'll talk about the dangers that may arise and now I don't have enough time and I don't think it's the intent of this talk to turn you into you know a review of the currently two or three hundred papers on this area what I do want to do though is take you through an example so that you understand why it's so hard to talk about risk of new technologies and so really my goal in that section is so that you go oh yeah I see why this might be difficult to provide technical data that might influence really the third part of my talk which is really the the more open-ended side which is that the ultimate goal of all of what we do as scientists, engineers, creating data, trying to make our applications uh, actually work, is really to inform decisions that people or society make about where that technology is going to go. And that third section I'm not really qualified to talk about from, a, from a, <laughs> any perspective other than as an actor, I guess, in, the, in those kinds of debates. So I'll give you my own perspectives there. Okay, so another way of looking at what I'm going to do is this. <laughs> I'm going to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly, which is the good side of nanotech, what got me into it, the bad side, which is a caricature of some of the issues that we face as we look at the possible dangers, and I'm going to use that word danger because it tends to wake people up, uh, and we'll, we'll look at that, and then finally the ugly, which is really the part I don't know how to deal with, which is what happens when all that information gets wrapped into this larger context of society. Okay. So let's start with the first part, why I got into nanotechnology in the first place. So um, nanotechnology, I have to show this slide because it's important. The word nanotechnology actually uh, it defines a technology area and I have to use the analogy to polymer technology. So you know polymer technology is kind of everywhere. You'll find polymers in your clothes now, in your cars, they're in computers. So it's not a single industry but it's, it's a material that shows up everywhere. And nanotechnology is very analogous. So in nanotech, Basically, we study and use materials with nanometer scale dimensions. Instead of a polymer or a plastic, we're dealing with nanomaterials. So it's fundamentally about stuff and using stuff to make better technologies, whatever they may be. Um, some of the, the dimensions you might be, you know, want to remind yourself of, because nano is a term for a size, the dimensionality and the, and the sort of physical representation of that size is important, so I showed you sort of one way to do it here. But basically, we're down on this scale. We're down on the scale where chemists are comfortable thinking about how molecules assemble and interact with one another. Um, it's certainly too small for most biologists to really think in a molecular way, although the, there's an overlap, as we'll talk about, between the biological length scales of proteins, uh, DNA, as well as nanotech. 
And you'll notice we're not really dealing with atomic forces. Those are actually much smaller in the realm of physics. So nanotech is really this one nanometer is 10 angstroms. A single carbon-carbon bond is about 1.4 angstroms. So in a single nanometer, you'd have 10 carbons. You know, so it's a big molecule. You can think of it that way. Or as I'm going to talk about, you can think of it as a little solid. So that's sort of the definition. And there are many. I've spent a lot of time defining nanotech. I didn't want to get into that with you guys. But basically, it's about technologies that use nanometer scale stuff. So why I decided to do nanotech actually was way back in 1987 at this stage. Um, and the reason was I was actually trained as both a chemist and a physicist. Uh, my undergraduate degrees were in both. So I was taking classes as a chemist and learning all about molecules. So here's a picture of a molecule C60. It's actually molecular. And chemists have ways of thinking about how we join atoms together and how to conceive of a molecule and understand its properties that have to do with molecular bonding. So there's a huge, rich discipline of chemistry that informs our understanding at the kind of one nanometer scale. The other thing I was doing, though, was I was actually thinking also of larger items, because in physics, you learn to think about solids. I was also taking biology. And their way of conceiving of matter had a different language, uh, would be a good way to describe it. Uh, and at the end of the day, though, if you're sitting in both kinds of classes, you're like, you know, this is at the end of the day the same stuff. So I was very compelled about studying materials, and this is a picture of one, which were really kind of in between, meaning that in many ways this item, which is a, a canonical nanomaterial, it's a cadmium selenide nanocrystal or quantum dot, really is a molecule. It's got about 2,000 atoms in it. Uh, this transmission electron micrograph, you can't see the surface of this, it terminates, but it's a beautiful crystalline lattice, and that's going to be an important feature of all nanomaterials. We don't just make stuff small, we make it very precisely. In this case, the precision is found in the crystalline order. These little columns of cadmium are not disordered, they're highly regular. That's critical for their, this particular system to have an application. Um, it's got a lot of surface, right? It has to be small. So 1 to 100 nanometers is the range. So this is 6 nanometers or 60 angstroms. And so it has to have a surface on it. In fact, there's a lot of organic molecules at the surface, thiophenol, big benzene rings, that permit this material to go into organic solvents. So even though it's kind of a solid, it's actually bigger than a lot of enzymes, it's got a molecular surface to it. So one of the things that drew me to nanotech was this concept that by studying nanomaterials, it was really a scientific driver, I would be actually forced to try to unify molecular views of the world with other views that might be biological or physical in nature. And it's kind of one thing we do as scientists is we like to find places where there's some sort of dissonance, something isn't making sense. And then you go in and you study something and it forces you to bring ideas together. So that was actually my, re my real motivation for choosing this topic in graduate school. And back in the 1980s, this was not a hot topic to say the least. It was this little eddy way. Nobody really knew about it. Okay, so. This is a cadmium selenide nanocrystal, so we've talked a little bit about the first feature of nanomaterials, or is they're small. And so this nanocrystal we talked about before, it's linking both molecular features as well as solid features. And in fact, luckily for me in my thesis work, I studied these particular objects, or quantum dots, and I was forced in my thesis, which was entitled The Electronic Structure of Semiconductor Nanocrystals, to really link how we think about molecules, how basically bonding works when you have two atoms talking to each other, and also how we understand, for example, how electrons travel through silicon, which is a crystalline solid, very different paradigm. And in understanding the properties of this thing, you really did have to link this chemical and physical view of materials, because it was the only way to understand it. And in fact, the description of, for example, the color of these materials very much draws on both disciplines. And so, that was kind of cool for me. So the point is, though, that one feature is they're small. They're not molecular, and they're not really something you can hold in your hand, but they share features of both. OK, what's another important feature about nanomaterials? Um, well, size does matter. You don't just make them small because you kind of want to do some cool science, although that was my original motivation. Um, I don't know how many of you guys saw this movie. I'm starting to get very old now, so sometimes I can't count. You were like three when it came out or something. Um, <laughs> So in any case, this is a great movie. And in fact, my students uh, came up with this quote. They loved it. They said, what it, there's a, Frank is this little tiny dog, and he had a little tiny gun, and then he blew up a big building. 
And he said, what is it with you humans in size anyways? Just because something's important doesn't mean that it can't be very, very, very small. And so the reason we go to all the trouble of making this stuff really tiny isn't necessarily the scientific driver that is motivating me in my early 20s. I wanted to understand these two different worlds. It was actually because they do weird stuff. When you make something that's not a molecule, it's not a solid, it's actually quite different. It's, it can have unexpected and very interesting properties. So a really good um, way to think about this, and this is a, perhaps going to be you know, something some of you who are nanotechnologists always get, is I like to explain it this way. If you take a piece of silicon, let's say, and uh, I, I should tell you beforehand I'm a cat person and my husband's a dog person, so that, that will inform this debate. Um, so if you have a piece of silicon and it's something that you can hold in your hand, maybe not this big, maybe this big, Okay, you can see it with your eyes. Silicon's gonna be a gray, kind of metallic looking substance. It's in all of your computers doing very important things. Um, you can see it, it's got a property, it conducts electricity, you can dope it, you can change it around. If you made that piece of silicon half the size, so instead of a millimeter across, it was half a millimeter. It would still basically be gray and metallic, have the same conducting properties, function very similarly. If you then made it half as small again, it would still basically be silicon, or the analogy I like to use, it would still basically be a dog. You know, it would be happy when you came home, it would chase and do fetch. It would be the same basic stuff, it would just be smaller. And it would have all of the properties you could have predicted, just in a smaller package. So you're down to a millimeter, let's go down to a micron, a thousand times smaller. Still, silicon would carry much of the electronic and optical properties that make it valuable in all of your computers. And in fact, many of the transistors that you're working with now, if you have your computer open, have those kinds of dimensions to them. But what's really weird about nanotechnologies, now that's a th one micron is a thousand nanometers. And you're really starting, and you can't see a, a one micron, it's less, your, your hairs are about a hundred microns. If you take it down to a hundred nanometers, all of a sudden, silicon is no longer a dog. It becomes a cat. You know, it's not very happy when you get home. <laughs> it does very different things. And it actually bears very little resemblance in color, conductivity, and any other property you choose to the original bulk material. It actually completely transforms. And what's really cool is its properties now become size dependent. The 30 nanometer silicon is a really different beast than the 10 nanometer silicon, than the 5 nanometer silicon. So all of a sudden you have a little knob. You have silicon, which is actually pretty nice, kind of boring sort of material. But you can do all sorts of weird stuff with it just by changing its size. It really transforms at some size. And the size at which materials, pick another material. Somebody suggest another kind of matter. <coughs> solid material. Gold. gold. Gold's a great one for this one. The size at which gold turns into a cat is actually going to be on the order of 80 nanometers. Depends on what you mean. It could be even be as much as 100. So where that threshold is for material will very much depend on the property and the material, but there's a transition where it becomes something I would use the word unfamiliar. Doesn't mean we can't explain the properties with the laws of physics and chemistry. We can in most cases. And if we can, it's just a matter of time. But it becomes extremely different. And so nanomaterials are weird. <laughs> they have properties, and this is a picture of a cat to remind you of that, that you would not normally have expected. And I'll take you through two examples about how we use that. And the final example is they are important. So they're small. They're weird and they're very important. And this is really, I think, gets into why I do nanotechnology now. Um, and probably why a lot of you chose the science and engineering path or to think about technology in some setting. And that is that the world has huge problems. Now these are two problems that we're dealing with at Rice University. We focus a lot on water. We focus a lot on medicine. Um, but think of another big problem that's facing the world, that if we don't solve it, you know, our children and grandchildren are going to have a really crummy life problem. Energy, right, duh, okay. So any, anybody else want to think of another one? Climate change. Climate change related to energy. Another one? Food, you know, related to population, right. There are big global problems that we're facing that don't have to do with just making somebody a lot of money or keep an economy alive. It might have to do with our survival as a species. And the solutions to those problems are not easy ones. But I would maintain, and you guys could argue, that technology will be a component of those solutions. A component, maybe not the whole thing. 
um, and certainly not in these complex issues. But what that means th is that we have to look at those problems from a new light and take our very latest concepts, ideas, and understanding of the world and apply them. And so when you think about nanotechnology, nanomaterials, what you're dealing with is a field, a discipline, that represents the last two to three decades of the most funding and the most support of any scientific discipline in all of the countries of the world. So if there are answers to be found in nanotech, now's a really good time to go harvest them. And so basically they're important systems because those weird features can be utilized to solve problems. And that's why they're important and that's why so many people are investing in them and thinking about them. In some ways you can say, yeah, it's just small materials, but on the other hand, they really offer to all of these problems some very intriguing possibilities. Okay, so some of the things, I'll just give you an example. So one of the features in nanotech we'll talk about later is that the different materials are not, it's not all the same stuff. So for example, here's some, you know, water purification. We'll talk about these two in a second. Here's some other catalysis work. Um, you'll notice that in these three pictures I have up here is one a cartoon, the other two are transmission electron micrographs. These are very vastly different materials. One is iron oxide or rust, another is gold, and another is actually a different kind of palladium on, on gold system. And that's one of the features is, nan in fact, you'll hear later about some carbon systems. Nanomaterials are not like carbon or gold. They're everything. As long as it's small, it's nano. So right away in the technical issues, you're confronted with a huge breadth of different kinds of stuff. And that's gonna make dealing with its risk very, very complex. And so that's one of our challenges. But it also is one of the great boons because one of the things that is true is we have a lot of different kinds of features that we're taking advantage of. In the case of the magnetite systems, the FE304, we're taking advantage in our application of the system to very unique size dependent properties. In the case of the gold on silica, my colleagues are taking advantage of optical properties. The color is different and that can be used. In the case of the sort of very unusual bimetallic clusters, gold, which we all think of as very unreactive, when it's nano becomes extremely reactive and very good at doing particular types of reactions that remove waste from water. <laughs> And so those are all examples of ways of utilizing these nanoscale properties. And so it has a very wide set of possibilities that, are, that we're looking at. And in fact, that's what, as I got into nanotech, I started out with this kind of scientific view. I wanted to understand, for example, the size-dependent changes in these semiconducting systems. I then became very intrigued by what we could do with that knowledge, how you could begin to apply our understanding to solve a problem. So the other feature of nanotech I want to leave you with um, is that the industry is emerging. Okay, so as we move into the application space, you might have heard a lot of different things. Is nanotech out there? Is it coming? Is it here? What's the deal? Here's a graph and there's a lot of different people, economists who have done projections of this industry, depending on the definition of nanotech and how broad you make it, but we sort of average them in this graph. Um, and what you can see is where we are here What's ahead of us is a huge increase in the number of nanomaterials in consumer products and placed into our environment. By any estimation, this is not going to fizzle and die. It's only going to increase. And some of these numbers are just astounding. So the ones that we average, the error bars, are very large. So there's a lot of disagreement about exactly how big. But what is true is everybody thinks it's exponential. So one of our challenges, as we're going to talk about the bad side, is that we're not dealing with a technology that's mature. We're dealing with a technology that actually has really yet to come forward. So when you talk about risk, what's it gonna do to me or my children if I use this stuff? You need to kinda know exactly what the stuff is, how it's formulated, and how you're using it. And if it's a really early stage technology, there could be a multitude of options before you. So that's one of the challenges with the age of nanotech and thinking about these issues. We're being very proactive. Um, in considering those issues, but it's very early. From an applications point of view, what I want to point out about nanotechnology is that this curve was not driven in the same way that biotech was. Does anybody know what made biotech explode? Who put the money in that made biotech what it is today? Who funded biotechnology? Who made it the powerhouse that it is? It's a pretty big industry. Any ideas? Agriculture. Agriculture industry. What's another industry that did it? pharmaceutical industry. The point is that many other emerging technologies you've heard and thought about were driven. You have to look at their origins. Who paid for them? <laughs> That's a very good question. Who paid for it? Um, whose, whose investment is on the line? 
in the success of that technology from an economic perspective. So in biotech, that was industry. Who is it for nanotech? Who has paid for nanotechnology? The government. The government. That's very right. Nanotech represents, and again, you guys will have to check me because I'm not, I'm not a, a study, I haven't done a study of this, but I do believe that this is the case. I think that nanotech represents one of the few cases where science was bundled up, sold to Congress as a big initiative that wasn't just about chemistry or physics or biology or geology, everything wrapped up into this glorious thing called nanotech and there were hearings and lots of reports and there was something called the National Nanotechnology Initiative. How many people have heard of that from the US? NNI, it's actually under review right now. The NNI passed in 2001. It was kind of like the climate change initiative that came before it. I work with Neil Lane, who was Clinton's science advisor, had a lot to do with the climate change initiative in Washington, D.C. He also had a lot to do with the architecture of the NNI, or the National Nanotech Initiative. It was an example at a time of declining funding for R&D. How do you go to Congress and make a case for putting money into the National Science Foundation or any other basic R&D. Well, you can't just say, hey, it's really cool to do this. You have to make it part of an economic thing. We're going to have the next internet. Our country will be famous and rich and we'll all live happy if you fund this. So the NNI was born and paid for by U.S. taxpayer dollars and what then ensued was an international space race mentality in which the EU, Japan, and other countries put in equivalent kind of anteing it up to the, to the tune of about $1.4 billion this year in our country alone. Some very interesting statistics about that, but yes, you had a question. I'm just wondering where the military is in all of this. Yeah, so, so let me take a moment. I wanted to bring up who paid for it, because if you think about ethics, I don't really know how to think about ethics, so I could be wrong. <laughs> you guys can tell me that later. But I think it's really important to understand who paid for, some, who stands to gain and whose, I hate to say, reputation is on the line in the success of something. So, the NNI, is a package deal. It's like rather than spending this much at the Department of Defense and this much at NIH and this much at NSF for R&D, let's package it all together, call it nanotechnology, single line item, and then we'll distribute it to the agencies. Okay, so the NNI is actually, it's not an appropriations, okay, so that's important, but we can get into that. It's, it's a little bit of funny money, but in any case, it's a central body in our federal government, and it represent, I, I think now, over 15 different agencies. So right down to the USDA and the Department of Commerce, the Department of Homeland Security. Each of those agencies has a little bit of money from, connected, not from the NNI, but connected to it. The number one agency since its inception was the DOD. So of the approximately $1 billion in nanotech per year, this is R&D money, DOD has had 40 to 50% of that money. So yes, it's very common in 6.1 and 6.2 research, as well as 6.3, which are the fundamental research applied and, of course, uh, more seriously applied military applications. That turns out to be a huge issue with when you talk to Europeans. They hate that. <laughs> um, it's a very, very big deal. In this country, though, people don't really understand the significance of this on a global scale. This makes it very difficult as a nanotechnologist when you go to Europe, for example, to talk about good nanotechnology. Um, the number two agencies and number three have kind of shifted between NIH and NSF. They've kind of gone back and forth. And then most of the others are way down below 5%. EPA is there, other agencies are there. So the point is that, that the governments of the world have paid for nanotechnology. It's a government push. Think of it kind of like the space race. And as a result, a couple of interesting things are true. Um, what that means is that government really, really wants and needs this to succeed. Does anybody want to guess what, what agency the NNI sits under in our government? Who kind of oversees it? Who gets the, you know, you can't just have this entity floating. Some agency kind of has to hold it and own it. Who do you think owns it? You think it's the National Science Foundation? <coughs> it's not the Department of Defense. Department of Commerce. Commerce. Commerce is the committee 
That is the committee. So it was sold as an economic thing. If our country invests, we'll have the next internet. We'll have all of the things about the United States that have actually kept us afloat, some people have argued, is our, is our penchant for innovation, our ability to do that. <coughs> Nanotech was sold along those, along those lines. And so what that means is that government has a role to play here that is very distinctive, which we'll get into at the end. The other thing you'll notice is the transition. The NNI started way back here. This is the size of the industry. It is just starting. Okay, it's really, really young. So a lot of the focus of government support has been on how do we get this stuff into the marketplace? How do we get it out of the labs? How do we do tech transfer? Because basically, if we don't see it showing up <laughs> and making a difference in people's lives, we're in trouble. So there's a lot of focus on tech transfer, especially in this new NNI bill, and equal focus on the next part of my talk. OK, so that's a little bit about where it's coming from. It's very young, and it's very strong government push. So I want to give you two quick examples, and I wish I had more time to do this, and some of you could tune out, I hope not, about why nanotech is cool. And I want to do this because I think if you look at any emerging technology, it's not just all about somebody making a profit. There are cool things that it does that are going to help people live longer, better lives. And one case of this is really um, work of my colleagues Naomi Hollis and Jennifer West at Rice University. So basically what they make is shown here. They make, think of a peanut M&M, <laughs> think of the chocolate as gold, and the peanut is silica. And you'll have pretty close dimensions to something called a gold nanoshell. Um, what we can do, what they can do with these things is they can grow that chocolate shell or gold shell to be thick or thin. And what it does is it might not look very interesting to you, but this is the absorption spectrum. So this shows you kind of the color. And what might be important is to notice the wavelength range. As you shift, these are the thicknesses of the shell, you actually see this peak absorption move around. Its color is changing. Uh, and you can sort of see it up here. This is a very thick shell, and this is a very thin shell, but it turns clear. Does anybody know why it turns clear? If you look at this graph, it's over here. 1,200 nanometers is near infrared light. And your eye can't see near infrared. So while this looks clear to your eye, it's absorbing near IR light super, super, super strongly. And that's a really a special feature. It's something you cannot get with any organic molecule. Because near IR light is kind of weak light. It doesn't really have enough oomph to do very much. But in a gold nanoshell, for some very interesting physical reasons, it's able to actually absorb near infrared light, which is about 1,100 nanometers. Why that's so important is shown here. This is actually the absorption coefficient of hemoglobin in water. And put together, it's similar to the absorption coefficient of tissue. So what this graph tells you is if you had near-infrared sight, like some kind of superhero, near-IR superhero, and you held up your hand to the glass, or up here, you would be able to see right through your hand because your tissue is transparent to near-infrared. Unlike visible light, it's not transparent, it absorbs. Hemoglobin, many of the other pieces of your body, don't absorb near-IR light. It's a window. It's called the water window. What this means is pretty cool for medicine. It means that you're able to use light to go deep into tissue and activate different processes if you've designed them. So you can now use near-infrared lasers, which are, by the way, some important components in things like CD drives nowadays, so they're easy to get. Shine them on tissue. It goes very deep, up to a couple of centimeters or inches, depending on the tissue. And it basically can go through tissue. Now, what can you do with that? Well, who can tell me? Black pavement, does it absorb sunlight or not? Black. Yes, black absorbs visible light. What happens to black pavement on a hot summer day? It's really, really hot. OK, so that concept is photothermal. It's the idea of absorbing light and converting it to heat. So what these investigators have done is shown that you can use nanoshells to absorb near IR light and heat up. And when they heat up, they can do stuff in your body. There's actually phase one cancer trials now for the use of these materials in head and neck tumors in UT San Antonio. It's one of the outcomes of the center. Uh, and it's very successful because these are inoperable tumors. And by infusing them with nanoshells and then literally no cutting, just shining light over them, you locally heat up tumors and allow them to shrink. Another cool example I like to just give is this, yes? Won't you also be heating up the tissue because? It's very localized. Because they're nano, very, very small, the thermal transfer is very localized. So the damage to tissue surrounding the nanoshells is very minimal because of their size and the nature of the thermal conductivity. So you actually have extremely localized. I wouldn't say you can kill a single cell, but you can certainly kill a couple hundred micron area. It's actually more limited by the optics of the near IR laser. 
So in this case, actually what Jennifer West did is she engineered a polymer that contained the gold nanoshells that when it was one temperature it was big and when it heated up it shrank. So it's like a sponge. And so the laser made it go from this size to this size. That's maybe cool, but she put insulin inside of it. So when you heated it up and it shrank, out came insulin. And you can see this injection of insulin into the body whenever a laser goes on. And these are actually pretty big patches, but it's exactly the kind of drug delivery you would need for a diabetic, especially a diabetic who was living in an area where they didn't have, for example, needles or access to clean needles. And so this is an idea that you could use a handheld laser over your skin to basically inject out a drug whenever you needed it. Um, why this is really special for nanotechnology or why it uses nanotechnology is this near IR. You can't get this any other way, not for any length of time. So that's one example. Another example from my own lab is actually nanoscale rust. So we make these materials. I've shown you a lot of TEMs. TEMs are really our, our, our eyes and ears. We look at our stuff this way. Um, and what we basically discovered is that these systems are really good magnets. So iron oxide's a magnet. It's lodestone. It's in compass needles. When you make it extremely small, it gets weird. It does something different. <laughs> One of the things that it does that's different is it becomes an incredibly good magnet. It's a far better magnet, meaning that when if I apply a magnetic field, it'll move faster and further than a larger piece because of the nature of its size. It's a very special feature of this material. And in fact, it's most uh, good right around 14 nanometers. One of the things that happens then is you can float these materials in a liquid like water. And in fact, arsenic is a system we've looked at very closely. And it absorbs arsenic to the surface of the iron oxide. That's just some chemistry. But more critically is that if I do stick a nasty contaminant like arsenic to the surface of this thing, and there's a lot of surface area in nanoscale materials, how do I get rid of it? Do I filter it? Do I let it settle? None of those things work with really tiny particles. They're very expensive. But one of the things we found is that a handheld magnet can just suck them right out of solution without any need for filtration or intermediate stages. And that's a really important feature for the water applications we're interested in, particularly point of use treatments. So it's an arsenic sponge. That's great. It's high surface area. But because of its size, and in fact, if you make them too big or too small, they don't really work very well for this magnetic removal. So what we're able to do is use them to treat water. And in fact, there's a batch system. This is with my colleague Mason Thompson and Doug Nadelson. And we're actually at the point of beginning to pilot some of these systems, which basically are designed for areas that have no electricity or no power, but they have either arsenic or other contaminant-laden water. Sand filters and other kinds of techniques to clean water have some significant disadvantages, especially in areas with high arsenic loads. So in this case, we would use our materials as kind of a magic dust not magic, it's just nanotechnology that you put in the water. Um, we put a magnetic plate at the bottom, so it takes it out of suspension very effectively, and then it leaves behind some very good water. So it's a very simple concept. Sometimes we put the mag magnet in a little baggie and we just dunk it in and then we pull it out. <laughs> uh, in any case, it's a much simpler way of dealing with arsenic and it works particularly fast because of the size of the particles. And it's a, a good system compared to other techniques for arsenic removal and right now we're working on some other heavy metals as well as organic effluents off of uh, agricultural sites which tend to have a lot of pesticides and other kinds of contaminants. So this is an example where nanotech is buying you high surface area so the stuff is sticking to the surface of the particle through chemistry that you've, divine, you've designed and you've got a magnetic property that's letting you stick very well to a low magnetic field. So those are two features that are very nice about this system. So I gave you kind of two examples. One was more medical, one was more in water treatment, the two areas we focus in in the center. But there's a lot of other examples that we could talk about. Energy, for example, which I didn't, it's so huge, I didn't want to go into it. Um, but in the next 50 years, people have envisioned many things, some of which are science fiction-y and some of which aren't, about uses of small-scale materials that are weird properties with very special structures. And that's the reason your government's put all this money into it, is this belief that it's going to make a difference. Um, and there really are a lot of, a lot of hits right now. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit at the end about where exactly you're getting it in your consumer products now. But there's a lot of stuff in the future that we have to look forward to potentially in the area. So that's really why I, you know, sort of the story of the good side of nanotech. Let's talk about the bad. And you'll see Tinkerbell. That's my symbol for the good. <laughs> Okay, so as I was doing all this work, uh, let me, let's now talk about the bad. Um, how I came to this question, and I think it was really a, how CBAN faculty at Rice came to the question, actually comes from the fact that we were a bunch of biomedical engineers, environmental engineers, people who wanted to make the environment cleaner and better, people who wanted to make 
better, healthier people. And in both engineering disciplines is a strong awareness of the impact of the materials on some other system. You can't get a drug through the FDA without doing a lot of safety trials, for example. So biomedical engineers are infused with an awareness of the FDA and the difficulties of proving something is safe. We also, working with environmental engineers who have been burned many times in the past by cleaning up the great successes of the past, right? You know, there are many examples of that. So those two disciplines, as we worked as a group, really are the ones who said, wait a second, how are we gonna get these things through the FDA? How are we gonna, are we just creating a problem that's gonna mimic some other environmental catastrophe that we had in the past? And so I think given the two areas we were working in, it was kind of natural to think about the bad. Uh, and this is a, really comes from my colleague, Kristen Kulinowski, who named the wow to yuck trajectory <laughs> as we talked about it. Um, and as a chemist, I'm really sensitive to this. So, you know, chemists are really good at making cool molecules that solve important world problems. Sounds familiar, right? It's kind of the reason I got into nanotech. Um, and there's a lot of examples, and there's a whole lot of examples of really bad environmental problems that arose from the sort of wide scale use of the materials before the possible risks were identified. So this, this path is not unknown to us, <laughs> especially chemists. We may not want to see it, but it's out there. Uh, the GMO debate is maybe the late, latest example where that's a biotech example, but a similar kind of concept. And so really, it can happen. It's totally normal for human beings to make technologies, think they're really great, and then 30 years later go, oh, what did I do, you know? Um, and what's bad about that is, I'll, I'll take the case of DDT, maybe not bad, but I'll make it as a comment. Um, Oftentimes, the sort of DDT, you know, there's a very interesting, whenever I talk about DDT, somebody gets on my case, so I thought I would do it here. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's an example of a molecule that saved millions of people's lives, millions upon millions of people's lives because it eradicated malaria throughout much of the equatorial world. Um, we didn't see it so much in this country in that sense. And that is huge. On the other hand, it has no, it's one of the most, it's just a bad substance to have in the environment. All kinds of bad stuff happens. A whole bunch of stuff people are finding out even now about it. And it's biopersistent, it gets into animals. And so it was banned throughout much of the world. It wasn't just sort of brought down or how can we do it better. It was just nobody can use it. <laughs> so the reaction, once the sort of cost was seen, was very swift and very extreme. And so there really wasn't a debate about what to do. It was just over. Although in this country, that's, that's still, still playing out. We won't, I won't go into that. Um, but nevertheless, I think what happens is that there are potentially important elements of these technologies, maybe that should continue or continue in different ways. And once you sort of 20 years later have a gotcha event where the public's accepted and embraced something, and then all of a sudden it had a negative consequence, there really isn't a lot of room for debate. It's just a very strong rejection of a technology. And so as a result, I think refrigerants are an example where the ozone hole actually is a really good case study for how maybe a new technology was changed and altered in ways that might have been effective. But in some of these other cases, it's a, it's a different story entirely. So again, we have this good and bad element going. So that was really how we started. We didn't really have any scientific data to say that nanotech would kill us all. We just looked at history and said, well, you know, new molecules, new stuff, everywhere in the world, maybe, you know, something could happen. But quickly, people really started to talk about the yuck factor. And there really are three things. You may talk about all of them in, in your, your courses. These are the three things that I find people think are yucky about nanotech. And the three images really represent them. The first is the gray goo concept. How many of you have read Prey? Oh, good, one. <laughs> it's not a bad book. Um, it's a Michael Crichton book, you know. Um, but he envisions uh, man-eating nanobots that swarm together and take over the world. Okay, so it's a fiction story. And as a scientist, I can't go into my lab and test whether or not that could happen because I don't know how to make nanobots that communicate and also nanobots that eat human flesh is out of my, maybe the 22nd century, but not the 21st. So lucky, lucky for me as a scientist, I'm just like, very interesting debates, really cool. We should have them. It, it relates to something called transhumanism, which probably you guys know a lot more about than me. Um, but that's not something that, as at least what I do as a scientist, I can really go out and test. Is it? Is there any technical data I could provide that would inform the debate? And the answer is no. The debate really is more about values. Um, 
now let's look at the middle. This is what we are going to talk about, a new kind of pollution. That is something I can go test. I can make materials. I can see, do they kill things? Do they not kill things? I can go evaluate that. So the center one is one that I put into my camp. It's something I can go into my lab and I can query and get data that could be useful to people thinking about the technology. The one on the right is very interesting. It's one that I've become sensitized to um, actually by a lot of interaction with social scientists and that is this concept of new economies. Um, a lot of, on the global scale of nanotech, um, there's a lot of activity at the OECD and the world, uh, all sorts of these international trade organizations. It's very controversial and it's controversial because basically people are worried about nanotech bringing forth new economies that disenfranchise people. The classic example that my friend Pat Mooney gives from uh, a non-governmental organization is what happens if carbon nanotubes become used in all of our computers as conductors, which is one of the applications for carbon nanotubes. They're a nanotechnology. He's like, what will happen to the copper miners in Africa? You know, basically his concept is as new technologies develop, these waves really wash out people who are already very poor and just sort of climbing onto the economic ladder. And so his questions, and in fact this is a very big deal, like I said, on the global scale, really have to do with control and social justice. Who will own nanotechnology? What countries will benefit from it? And again, those are questions that I think are fascinating. I can't really go into my lab, my, my little world, which is very narrow, and help. <laughs> help do much with that kind of question, but it's a very important one. And it's, it's a source of a lot of uh, hostility and concern about nanotechnology. The one in the middle, as I said, which is new pollutants, is the one that I think this country, and you know, being the US and, and all of our existing way of looking at technology, can really connect to, and that's the one that it's been working on. But I think globally, this one is far more important. Okay, so why worry? So we worried about it just because, well, heck, in the past chemists have made stuff that does good stuff and then in the end it, it's really bad, so <laughs> that's not much to hang a hat on. So um, le there are many other reasons to be concerned about nanomaterials. Uh, some good things, some good news and bad news from the existing literature. The good news is nanomaterials exist in nature. Uh, and this, I love this argument. People are like, look, there's tons of nanomaterials that are produced when a volcano erupts, lots and lots of different nanoscale carbon soot go into the atmosphere and, hey, we're all alive, so it all must be safe. I like that one, you know. <laughs> it's like, look, just because something's natural doesn't mean that it's safe. Um, not to mention the fact that what comes out of this volcano isn't necessarily the same stuff that they want to put into your computers. Uh, I love this example because it's what got me started on the nanomagnetite. This is a bacteria that forms the same stuff we used in water treatment uh, internally. It eats iron, turns it into iron oxide, and in fact uses these little particles to help navigate it through, through sediment and mud. <coughs> So there's lots of naturally occurring nanomaterials. So maybe that's a good thing. Evolutionarily, maybe we've come to learn how to manage those as organisms. It's not like they're totally foreign. On the other hand, this picture, which didn't come out very well, is a bunch of ski waxers. <laughs> it's a more modern view of an occupational hazard. So in the 1990s, it's a very tragic story actually, I think it was 1994, all of a sudden, across the world, ski waxers and ski resorts started to go to hospital emergency rooms in large numbers, many, you know, not a small fraction died, the rest were in the hospital for a very long time with pulmonary illnesses, rather severe illnesses, uh, inflammation of the lungs, uh, fluid filling the lungs. Does anybody know why that might have happened? All of a sudden in 1994, boom. Yeah? The fluorinated waxes. That's right. The companies that sold the fluorinated waxes reformulated. And when you heat up those waxes, they were able to stabilize small nanoscale particles. Nanoscale particles, when they're inhaled, can penetrate further depending on their surfaces. And as a result, they can go very deep in the lungs. The theory right now is those fluorinated particles had other, um, if you've heard a lot about the bisphenols, plasticizers that were released deep in the lungs that did permanent lung damage on a number of different people. So. And this is unfortunately not a story that, that only goes with the 1990s. Um, this is the story of human history in the Industrial Revolution. Coal miners, disease, uh, you know, the very first one. Another one, silicosis, uh, for a lot of people who use sledgehammers are involved in construction. Uh, these are basically occupational diseases caused by the inhalation of nanoscale particles. And it's a huge area. So basically, there's some reasons to worry about nanoscale. Maybe, maybe they're safe, you know, it's not like they're totally new, but certainly a lot of evidence that if, especially if you inhale them, um, there could be issues. 
Okay, so I'm going to take you through one actual study of a nanomaterial, what's called an engineered system. So this system is not engineered. It was accidentally produced like diesel particles, which are also nanoscale in nature, but they're not engineered for that reason. What about a, a material that we've made in a laboratory, C60, or this is a down view of single wall nanotubes, that really we created for a function? What does it do? And in this question, we're going to ask kind of the basic environmental chemistry and bio biology questions. So this is kind of where we were in 2002, 2003. There was zero data on engineered nanomaterials. We were kind of looking at the existing literature and saying, well, maybe something could happen. <laughs> So we went to the carbon systems first because they are some of the most unique and special systems that uh, kind of the poster child at Rice at least for nanoscale materials. Um, a little bit about them, this is a buckyball, 60 carbons arranged in the size of a soccer, kind of where it looks like a soccer ball. Um, it's about a nanometer across, so it just barely makes the cutoff for nanotechnology. In fact, a lot of chemists just say, ah, it's a big molecule, which it is, it's a big molecule. A nanotube, I wish I had another image, it's a rolled up sheet of graphite, very similar in form, composition, it's just now a tube, not a ball. It can be very long, microns long, could be short, could have different stuff on the surface. What you see here is soap. One of the features of both of these substances when we started off, so this is the story, in 2002, 2003, I sat down with the environmental engineers, I said, okay, we got the money, we got the center, let's look some of this, do some environmental chemistry on this stuff. And we decided to start with the carbon systems. <clears throat> Does anybody know why we decided to start with the carbon systems? Why we, we're, we're at Rice, there's another reason. What is the, if you think about environmental systems, what is the one liquid that controls pretty much everything? about transport, distribution, what is it? Water. Yeah, it's really weird, because like as a chemist, I work in nasty organic solvents, but you know, the real world is all water. So the reason we chose these two is we thought they would be really easy. These are black powders, and they're among the most hydrophobic stuff I have ever encountered as a chemist. I take this black powder, I throw it into water, I shake it up, and there's black powder, and there is water, and that is it. The solubilities of both of these substances in water are like 10, 10 to the minus 10. They just don't go into water. So we liked them as a negative control. We're like, cool, we'll have something that doesn't go into water, it'll just sit there, maybe it'll bind to soil or something, but it's not gonna be transported by water. Okay, so this is actually how we started. So, you know, we had this question, is it gonna act more like a polyaromatic hydrocarbon, which it shares some features, or more like carbon soot? And just so if you wanted to know, is it on the market? The answer is yes. This is a face cream you can buy in Italy. It's also C60, which is the substance we'll primarily be talking about. You can also find in mascara. It's nice and black. And I'm not kidding, because it's a little ball, has really, really good lubrication qualities. So it's on the market in cosmetics. Uh, un we'll talk about it at the end. Unknown to you if you're exposing yourself to it, because it's not labeled. But nevertheless, it's out there and in use, and it's quite expensive, actually. This is a I think this little thing is like $180 now. Okay, so we started with this and here's the stuff, okay, and, and so I'm working with environmental engineers, so here's what I do as a chemist. Is something soluble? Think of table salt. Get water, throw salt in, look, filter, measure salt in water. That's what a chemist does. If I'm being careful, I might put a little top on the water and purge it of nitrogen. I'll measure very carefully the sodium and chloride levels, but that's what I do. Environmental engineers are totally different. When they say solubility, they mean something different. They didn't just toss the stuff into water. They put it in water with co-solvents. They let it stir in water for a month under sunlight. They did the stuff that happens when you dump stuff into water, which isn't like you shake it for 10 minutes and you filter it, which is what a chemist does. So in this particular process, they actually used a co-solvent, which is tetrahydrofuran. Um, which is a very common co-solvent to use to see if something's insoluble, could you maybe get a little bit more in? Funnily enough, every little bit of that black powder went into water. The THF levels are extremely small here, not very much. Um, but that THF was able to use, get this stuff soluble through a mechanism I don't have time to talk about. Um, you can remove the THF by boiling it off. And guess what? We still had stuff extremely soluble in water. There it is. Uh, and there's our final suspension. Now, to a chemist, the concentration of C60 in this stuff is, is on the order of micro to millimolar. So if I'm a chemist, that's pretty insoluble. Meaning, okay, so a little bit of it, if you beat on it with some THF, goes into water. But it's not really soluble to a chemist. Now, to an environmental engineer, 
this level of solubility is huge. So the polyaromatic hydrocarbons, some pretty bad environmental actors, are sparingly soluble hydrocarbons. They go in at about the same level. And when they got this data, they were like, heck, this stuff is going to be transported by water. This is huge. I'm like, what? You know, it's only like micromolar. And they're like, no, it matters if it's micromolar and it kills stuff. You know, it matters. So um, if you want to know what it is, it's actually an aggregated form of C60. Point I'll make at the end is when stuff enters the environment, it doesn't stay what it was. It's transformed by the environment. That's one of the complexities we deal with in characterizing risk. And these are some TEMs. Now, you might think this is a picture of C60. It isn't. If you're a C60 or, you know, it's like this little tiny point. <laughs> so these aggregates contain tens of thousands of C60 molecules. They really are very much like pristine C60. They just happen to be clumped together. So the hydrophobic, greasy part is on the inside, and the outside is more of a water-soluble form. This is an ideal delivery agent if you want to get C60 into cells, by the way, <laughs> um, because it takes this very hydrophobic substance, and it makes it stable enough in water to interact with organisms, which is what our next step was. So we were very, very interested and surprised by this observation that we could get stable suspensions. Uh, we did a lot of studies in cell culture of what it did. So this is an example of the kind of data we might collect. We would collect how many cells die after 48 hours of exposure to that yellow solution. Answer is a lot of cells die. These are different types of human cell lines in this case. This is very good for differential cytotoxicity. We did a lot of bacterial strains. If you're interested in environmental systems, bacteria are at the bottom of the food chain. What's interesting here is that the C60 systems are really good antimicrobial agents. They're broad spectrum antibiotics at very low levels. Depends a little bit on the form and how the aggregates are made. A lot of other nano stuff isn't, so it's not a feature of nanoscale materials. It's unique to the carbon systems. Uh, there's been a lot of aquatic developmental toxicity already on the C60. To make a long story short, yeah, it has some big effects on aquatic organisms for a lot of different reasons. Um, in this particular example, uh, we were looking at the embryos of zebrafish, which is a developmental tox test, which is, by the way, one of the routes for DDT to, to do its bad stuff. Uh, one of the interesting things about this data set is this is kind of how many of them become sick versus time, is we added glutathione, which is an antioxidant, and that was able to mitigate the effects, which suggest a mechanism. Um, interestingly enough, then, when you look at C60 and you start to compare it to other molecular environmental contaminants, here's kind of how it stacks up. Um, this is a little bit tricky, but I just wanted to point out Paraquat. Who knows what Paraquat is? Anybody heard of it? Paraquat? A few? Anybody want to tell me what it is? Insecticide. Yeah, it's, it's bad stuff. Bad, bad stuff. Um, so you can see Paraquat, the dose to kill a bunch of cells is 100 milligrams. So you need a lot of it. This uh, NC60, which is what we term this stuff, you need far, far less. So comparatively on a per weight basis, it's a lot more acutely cytotoxic than Paraquat. Interestingly enough, we could only find one substance to act as a positive control, and we were not allowed to work with it in the laboratory, and that's dioxin. So whatever is going on, it's, it's very effective. Yes? How do these numbers transfer to the molarity? That's a really good question. It gets worse. So one of the features of nanomaterials is that the molecular weight of C60 is 720 grams per mole. The molecular weight of a typical organic is maybe 100, 150. So if you divide this by the molecular weight to get to molarity, it's actually going to get far worse. So. The per gram number is what we stick with because molarity is a little tricky. Is it the aggregate? Is it the single molecule? But the molarity numbers actually get worse when you do the conversion. But we're looking at PPB levels or sub nanomolar would be a way to answer it. Okay, so this doesn't necessarily worry me. None of these are real animal studies with the exception of the zebrafish. And there's a lot of work you need to do to establish causality for toxicity, but this does suggest that this is by no means an inert biological substance. It has a big effect on environmental organisms. Why it does so, um, very interesting, and I'll, I'll briefly tell you the answer. If you make a molecule and you put it into the environment, I kind of was a silly chemist. I thought, if I want to make a safe molecule that has no impact, I really want it to not be water soluble because then it won't go anywhere. And if it's really water soluble, It'll go into biological organisms and interact with us. And my environmental engineers, we had this really interesting conversation. He's like, no, 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 no. You want it to be water soluble. I said, why? And he's like, the environment is really, really, really big. And I said, yeah. He's like, like 10 to the 12 liters. You know, to the chemist, it blows my mind. Huge. He goes, if you drop in your little 100 you know, kilograms of C60 into the environment 
and it goes everywhere over the 10 to the 12 liters, you got no dose at all. Just nada, it goes everywhere. He goes, now, if you make it partially soluble, so that it doesn't really go into water, but just enough that it goes into water and then it finds every single bit of fatty tissue it can and it concentrates itself, then you have a recipe for disaster. So all of the worst environmental contaminants tend to have something called KOWs, which is how much goes into water, that are partially soluble. And that lets them get into the food chain, but once they're there, they sequester in fatty tissue and they usually bioaccumulate if they don't kill the organism first. So C60 is not a bioaccumulant primarily because it's so acutely toxic. It kills lower organisms and then they die and they get distributed. So there hasn't, we've been looking for bioaccumulation, but the problem is if you dose it onto bacteria or worms and they die, you know, and you can't take the dose small enough that you could still detect it, you can't really measure bioaccumulation without some special stuff. So nevertheless, it's this, it's, it's got something to do with its chemistry, but probably more just to do with the fact that it is this partially soluble substance. Kind of an interesting lesson there. Okay, so they have distinct environmental properties. They're different than PAHs because they are aggregates. They're big, so they're transport properties. They're not gonna move far from a site because they are 10 to 100 nanometers but they're not really solid materials either. So a couple of lessons, what goes in isn't what comes out. When nanomaterials enter the environment, they get transformed by a whole bunch of different mechanisms. I haven't talked about them all. They can get biodegraded. They can physically attend, they can dissolve. Um, most of them, however, are quite persistent because that's how we engineer them. If our nanomaterials had crummy coatings on them and dissolved in water, they probably wouldn't be good for the use they were intended for. So we're finding a lot of systems that are persistent, but they often aggregate into larger clusters. And so that's one of our complexities is that what goes in isn't what comes out. We refer to this concept as the nano-environmental complex. So the material is not just dumped and sort of moves as an isolated entity through the environment or through organisms. It actually is constantly transformed. So we think about it literally kind of like a complex. Um, one of the other things we worked a lot on is dealing with the toxicity. So one of the things that we did early on is we hypothesized that if we could create more polar materials that were really water soluble, like we intentionally made them that, that they wouldn't do squat in organisms and that's exactly what happened. Um, if you look at the cell culture data, these are, this is a bad actor, you'll notice it has no derivatives, that's a chemical term, but it has no polar derivatives on its surface, just a little greasy ball. As I, we start to decorate the system up to make it more polar, we create a substance that even at very high concentrations has virtually no influence on cell culture or in ecological systems that we've looked at, although we need to do more chronic studies. So this led us um, to this concept of safety by design. So rather than now, we don't ask the question, are engineered nanomaterials dangerous? We ask the question, how do we engineer them safely? Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about safety by design, but it's a big theme of what we do as chemists. We can do a lot of stuff once we have the mechanism of toxicity on a substance. We can go back and try to engineer it so it's not toxic. In the case of C60, we make it, less soli we make it more soluble in water, which, by the way, has consequences for its performance in a number of applications, and we can talk a little bit about that. So this is a, a shift in the frame of the question, which I think is an interesting one in the, t in the field generally. So we're looking at this concept of safety by design. Is it doable? What do we need to know to do it? The final kind of issue we, comes back to the point I made before about the challenges for risk assessment generally. We talked about this one case of C60, but what about the future? You know, we picked C60. For all we know, that substance is going to go nowhere and there'll be some other nanomaterial. So what do we choose? Well, there's a whole bunch of nanomaterials, a whole lot of exposure pathways, and to make it all worse, I'm going real fast through these slides, you can have them later, um, is really this, we call it the combinatorial problem. And this is where biotech and nanotech diverge in an important way. When you're thinking about biotechnology and detecting, for example, whether or not a gene's been introduced into a plant and what its effects are, you have a single gene sequence that you can just, you know, literally tell me what every base is. In the case of nanotech, I've got complex mixtures. So I had this conversation with a toxicologist about are single wall carbon nanotubes going to be toxic? So single wall nanotubes is this sort of long tube of carbon. Well, there are 20 major types with a whole bunch of different types of impurities with lots of different lengths. And as a chemist, I can cloak them with whatever service you want. If you want polyethylene, if you want polyacrylic acid, if you want a phenol, we can do that. Um, we can purify them differently. To make a long story short, 
in this single material, I could create easily 50,000 different types of nanotubes, probably more. So it's not really, is this one substance toxic? Because that's really the paradigm for environmental testing and risk assessment is what is the substance, how are you using it, and what is the risk? What do you do if you've got millions of substances that you could make? You have a whole library of possible options. And what you don't, you don't want to know is a single one dangerous. You want to know in this whole landscape of features, where do I want to make my material? What are the, what are the features I want to engineer? And that's actually really hard for conventional risk assessment paradigms to manage. They tend to be very linear. And what's needed is a much more uh, different kind of view of that. So one of the things we work on a lot is borrowing from drug development, which is something called quantitative structure activity relationships. We try to identify what specific molecular size, other features of nanomaterials correlate with environmental outcomes. And so we look at a landscape of choices, not a single material in a single use setting. And we've done that in a lot of different systems. I just talked about carbon. We've done a lot. And fortunately, the story is different. I wish I could say, hey, don't make stuff larger than 10 nanometers, and everything will be fine. The story very much depends on the exact substance you're thinking about, the composition of the parent material, but you can always discern trends. <coughs> The other thing we're working on a lot, and this is particularly pertinent because there was just a hurricane, and this is Houston, where I'm from, and this is a hurricane that's hitting, actually not Houston, just to the north of us, not Katrina, it's Rita. But why I wanted to put this up is that the old way of thinking about risk, and this is a technical perspective really, is that there's a specific material, specific use with well-defined hazards that you've characterized. The new way, though, is really forecasting. We want to be able to forecast for a certain combination of choices what the outcome is going to be. And that is immensely, you know, scary as a scientist because there's so many variables. But I'm really, you know, I'm inspired by the fact that these models of weather, what could be more complicated than modeling weather? Okay, this storm track that you're looking at was generated by a computer-based model that was heavily informed by experimental data. It was a forecast of where a hurricane was going to go. And this forecast had huge impact on policy decisions made by all of the counties and states in its path. So this is a great example of what we can do now by merging some of the advances in information technology with how we think about environmental systems. And I think it's a really exciting area. Uh, it's very daunting. Uh, it's hard when you think about the complexity, but that's what computers are getting very good at doing is creating these graphical systems to help you simulate and understand how these might all fit together. So a lot of our work now is converging on this kind of approach. So if we can forecast hurricanes, I think we can at least begin to forecast environmental impact. Okay, so I want to just end, and this is much more open-ended. Uh, we talked about the good, we talked about the bad. Probably you don't want to use C60 in mascara, that would be my advice. <laughs> um, and now I want to talk about the ugly, um, and that is who takes all this information and uses it? Who are the deciders? Um, so who are the deciders? What's going to happen to nanotechnology? Should we stop it? Should we continue it? Who will decide? Anybody want to throw out possibilities? It depends on the government because it's not funding. Okay, so the government will decide. That's one. Yeah? Consumers. Good point. That's on my list. So we have government, consumers. Anybody else? Media. Media? Very good. <coughs> Anybody else that you think might be the decider? Policy makers. Policy makers, which are slightly different than government because you can include think tanks and NGOs. Industry or investors. Yeah, industry. So it's a really complex set of people, right? that really are very different than what we've just been talking about, which is kind of the you know, scientific realm. And so as I've gotten into this personally, and I've done a lot, you know, some of the scientific research, I've over the last four years come away with some, let me tell you who's deciding and how they're deciding. So all of these are in play right now. All of these people are in various ways deciding either through action or through their inaction. <laughs> so be aware that decisions can get made by doing nothing. Um, and so where do you, what do you think people are doing? We haven't really talked about this. You might have talked about it before. What, do you think the temperature of the climate toward nanotech is very pro or very cautious? 
What's your sense of it? Is it all full speed ahead or is it pull back? How many people think it's full speed ahead? How many people think it's a little pull back? Half and half. Well, I have some news for you. <laughs> <laughs> so it's actually not dependent on the country. Surprisingly enough, the, the global situation is quite constant at this point. There's some very noisy non-governmental organizations we can talk about who are arguing strongly for pullback. Um, but your government and consumers generally are very pro. Uh, there has been no, while you may hear something about it, it's generally, I have been astonished in the last four to five years, especially with some of the recent data, at how slow the boat is moving, okay? So let me go through some examples of what might be going on. So, um, oh, let me, I must have a hidden slide. Can I get to my, let me see, where am I? Yeah. Ch -ch 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 -ch. Yeah. I don't know why it does this. Has anybody ever had this happen to them? <laughs> okay, so we're gonna go kind of my talk now just to make some points. So. I want to start with scientists and engineers because I think that that was a point made and when I started off I, I really never thought of myself as a decider and I don't think that we are. But one of the features um, of what's going on is the need to make a decision. Do we put C60 in mascara? If we do, do we label the bottle? <laughs> um, those are real hardcore decisions somebody's got to make. The problem is they need all this new information that we create in places like research labs. And the problem is this valley of death for science policy, meaning that the information that comes out in the peer-reviewed literature right now is over a thousand papers, and I mean just exploding exponentially in this topical area. So there's a need to inform, collect the information, filter it, begin to frame it, and create debates about it. That's kind of a process. And right now, there is nobody or no one to do that. So scientists and engineers really don't write policy positions, or I would argue maybe they shouldn't. But on the other hand, they really need to be able to play in this space because the thing people want from them isn't, here's my list of 40 publications, go read them. They need somebody to step back and say, what does it all mean? You know, And the problem is, there's a lot of judgment calls. I mean, there are over 100 papers now on the environmental impact of C60. I hate to tell you, they're really controversial. <laughs> I mean, there's my view of it, there's other views of it, and it's technical. It's like, well, was THF a co-solvent or not? You know, Very minute details that are causing the scientific community to really anguish over the answer. So asking somebody to do this, I mean, you need the people who created it to be as involved as possible in organizing that. But in that process, they do influence the debate in some very interesting ways. So one way that, that um, let me see if I can go back to my slides now. So I kind of realized this early on because the demand that people had on me to write review papers <laughs> and do this synthesize is enormous. I mean, it's like people are dying for this, especially all of these people, right? Only one group of which actually has a lot of detailed information about the issues in the technical literature. What about all these other groups? Maybe they're just not going to use the scientific literature, which is what happens if we don't figure out how to get this working better. So one of the solutions at Rice was to actually start a forum for this, because we realized early on that we needed to do this. And it was really about communication, but to many different audiences. So what we did, because we realized that academics on high saying this is true doesn't always work, and, and letting industry or another stakeholder group doesn't <coughs> work either. So Kristen Klinowski, one of my colleagues at Rice, Rice, really founded this organization to create a collaborative effort so people work together to do that sort of process of taking the technical information, organizing it, collecting it, validating it, debating it, not going to the point of writing a policy position, but getting it further along. What's really important about ICON and why it's worked is that it's not a single stakeholder group, it's a collaborative organization. And so it's volunteer based, funded in both by government and industry, and that creates an environment for lots of different people to participate in organizing the information. Some of the examples of what we do are we had a big survey that industry was very involved in on the current practices for nanomaterial handling in the workplace. How are people handling nanomaterials? Are they going to come down with some dread disease? And we have a whole big report on it, a lot of studies on what people are doing for protective measures. And this is turning into a Wikipedia type entry um, probably in the fall of this year. Again, a large group of people from all over the world who are working on this. 
uh, we do a lot of work now, and this gets back to kind of our original motivation, about putting research into perspective. So I don't know how many of you heard about multi-wall carbon nanotubes and mesothelioma, but there was a report in May in fact, there was a prior report by the Japanese that single wall nanotubes um, can act like asbestos, which is a big deal because uh, multi-wall nanotubes in particular are sold now in a number of consumer products, most notably thermal blankets that I've seen one. If you put your hand on it, you take it away, it's black. <laughs> but it's a very good thermal electrical insulating blanket. Um, so they're out there on the marketplace. And this study published by Ken Donaldson in Scotland came out in Nature Nanotech talking about whether or not they acted like asbestos. Very controversial paper, scary because mesothelioma, which is the disease that you get, the cancer you get if you get asbestosis, is a, it's a death sentence. If you have it, you're dead. And in fact, there's a huge exponential rise in cases from exposure to asbestos in the 60s. So what we did at, at ICON is we interviewed a number of different people ranging from industry to environmental defense who had read the paper. We had the, the texts of their interviews on the page. We call it, if you only have five minutes to think about this topic, this is probably one of the best, most neutral places to go to get the different viewpoints about the paper, what it was about, and what people think. We've done that in probably four cases now. And we're getting to the point that scientists who are publishing controversial papers are coming to us and asking us to do this. And what really seems to be people love the most are our brief little interviews where we just ask the different people, the authors, somebody else, what do you think? <laughs> and in those interviews, you can really get a sense for the, what, that, what it really means. <clears throat> we did another one, which are nanoparticles and fibrillation, which is diseases related to Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, which is another interesting connection that's been developing. So I don't think scientists and engineers are the deciders. And in fact, I actually think they really shouldn't be the deciders because it destroys their credibility to provide neutral information. Um, so unfortunately, being a decider is being a decider. <laughs> and being the creator of the data is being the creator of the data. On the other hand, if they don't participate here, I think the technical data does leave the debate. And I think that's a problem. I think technical information has a, has a role to play. And so that's one. Let's talk about another decider. Consumers is deciders. Somebody mentioned them. Here are three products that have nanomaterials in them. All of you are deciders because all of you use probably personal care products that have nanoparticles in them, whether you know it or not. Um, some of these you might not think are worth the effort. For example, you know, tennis balls that last longer that have ceramic nanoparticles, eh, worth it, maybe not, because the benefits, you have to buy fewer tennis balls. Is that really worth, you know, putting a lot of ceramic nanoparticles into landfills? On the other hand, sunscreen is a very interesting topic, because sun cancer, skin cancer is a known killer. So we'll get into that if you want. Um, so consumers are deciding for sure. And in fact, they've been an important force in the GMO debate. The media informs them. So there's been a number of studies uh, that I've seen, and most people who are in communications tend to agree that people, the general public, whatever that might mean, and they're complicated, tend to get their information from the media, not even the print media, really television and radio. But nevertheless, here are some examples. The media is certainly playing up this story. Interestingly enough, I've seen some studies that 80% of the stories on nanotech in the US media still are positive meaning that even though we see the negative stories about it's going to kill us all, they're not the predominant ones. Um, so the media plays a role here, whether they're consciously deciding, I don't know, I think they're just trying to sell newspapers. So what they tend to do is create polarization. They make, of course, more extreme points of view. This is a study by a uh, CBEN researcher, Steve Corral, who's now at University of College London. He's a psychologist who actually looked at the impact of this media on people's trust and perception of nanotech. I like this graph because it really shows what we all kind of know instinctively, that people are gonna make decisions about technology based on the risk benefits. So this is a perception of risk, and I, don't, I can't do justice to the methods that Steve used in this, except to say that they were quantitative and extensive. So this is the risk perception, and this is the perception of benefit. So his, his thesis is, of course, people are trading risk against benefit. What he did that was so interesting, though, is he put nanotech on the same map yeah, this is dead now, as a lot of other new technologies or old technologies. So for example, asbestos is here. People perceive asbestos as very, very high risk with very, very low benefit. Okay, so this quadrant is bad. Things are here, society has probably rejected them or is getting ready to reject them. 
Uh, and that means no matter what governments or industry want to do, people aren't going to buy it and they're going to protest against it and forget about it. Some interesting ones up in the upper right are firefighting and police work. High risk but high benefit. Of course we're going to do that. Um, what's interesting is nanotech, biotech you can't see, it's kind of straight above nanotechnology. But nanotechnology is really right in the middle. And he argues in this paper that's because the level of knowledge about nanotech is very low. And that means that people don't really know very much yet. They're kind of, you know, that's, that's actually borne out by a number of studies. And so I think the point is it could go either way. The media could take it up into the good quadrant, meaning it's low risk, high benefit, or take it down. As a scientist, I can only hope that technical information plays some role in where that public opinion falls. Uh, and that's, of course, a, a challenging thing to ensure, but we can only hope that will happen. The last point, of course, is that all of you use stuff. So does anybody want to know what this is that you're looking at? It's a scanning electron micrograph, 500 nanometers. So this, my hand, is, an, is 100 nanometers. See this fluffy stuff? See the rods? Anybody want to guess what that is? No? It is a sunscreen. <laughs> so if you're using a sunscreen that claims UVA protection, you are almost certainly coating your body with a whole bunch of nanomaterials. We estimate something like three kilograms of nanoscale titania f if you're wearing sunscreen, if you're on vacation all year <laughs> and you're really using the sunscreen at the level it's, it's, it's recommended. This is a L'Oreal product, but the reality is if you're wearing sunscreen and it's clear and you read the back label and you see TiO2 or zinc oxide, it's nanoscale. We haven't found a single product on the market that didn't have nanoscale pigments in it. Um, these materials, the light fluffy stuff is TiO2. The big stuff here is zinc oxide. A lot of, you know, hand wringing about whether or not this stuff gets through your skin. You know, if anybody's ever worn sunscreen and you really slather, if you're slathering this stuff all over your body every day for a week on vacation, I mean, you get it in your mouth, you get it in your eye. I mean, you're, gonna, you're exposed to the substances. What's very interesting is the thickness of these layers. These are heavy coats, and they have to be because this is why it protects you against UV light. You are coating every square, if you're doing it right, every square inch of your body with nanoscale materials in order to block the UV light from coming through. The question is, what's your alternative? <laughs> um, because if you let, you know, many of you, if you let the skin just see the sun, you're going to be, you know, have a higher risk of skin cancer. So this is a very controversial area now. Um, you decide. The interesting thing is that in the 1990s, 1999, the FDA made a very important ruling, which you'll probably hear more about later this week, which has colored many regulatory decisions about nanotech. And that ruling was the following. A consumers group, advocacy group, wanted this stuff, this TiO2, which is so small you can't even see it at this resolution really, to be labeled as nano. They said, you know, TiO2 is different when it's nanoscale than when it's bulk. And we've just spent a lot of time talking about that. The FDA in its wisdom had a big hearing and industry made a very weird argument. They said, no, actually micronized TiO2 has a size distribution which is peaked at three microns. But some fraction of micronized TiO2, which was already on the list, maybe is always nano. So that's contained in the existing monograph of TiO2. The difference now is that, of course, they're intentionally making it nanoscale, so 95, but we didn't find any pigment here that was larger than, a, you know, 200 nanometers. So because of that ruling, there is no labeling requirement for nano or the size. You'll only find composition of the pigment, not if it's nano or not nano. When I get asked about it, what do I use on my kids? And I just took a vacation in Utah where I really, my kids are very fair skinned. Um, I do the following. If you have children, you know, I use, use clothing. That's kind of how folks who grew up in the desert do it. If you're not gifted with pigment, um, that seems to work okay. Uh, and then the other thing I do is I do slather it on. I tend to choose zinc oxides over TiO2s just because, um, does anybody know what nanoscale TiO2 is really good at more than anything? It's wide, it's widest use, number one use next to pigments here. Yep. I know I've seen it like, it's bulk fillers in a lot of foods. Used in a lot of foods? Actually, I don't think it's food technology. It might be bigger. Anybody know another use for nano TiO2? It's really good at absorbing UV light. Does anybody know what it does with that light? Uh, uh I wish. Then you would look white. 
That's why, you know, the old-fashioned sunscreens when you were like three, <laughs> they might have been white. Uh, these days they're clear. Uh, TiO2 is one of the best photocatalysts out there. It makes copious amounts of OH radicals upon exposure to UV light, and in fact, we use it in my lab for treating water for that, using that chemistry. So I'm just a little eh about putting something that might have photocatalytic activity. Catalysis, by the way, means light hits it, it makes an OH radical, but it can do that like a billion times. <laughs> It doesn't just react once and go away. So, I, you know, and the other thing we know about this stuff is that it tends to compact down in your hair follicles, which have a cycle of about 30 days. So it's going to be on your body for a fairly long period of time. Might be good news for protecting yourself from skin, from the sun, but again, if these photocatalytic properties are activated, which in some samples they were, maybe not good long term. Yep. Do those hydroxyl radicals come airborne? I mean, are they... They potentially could, but generally not. I think they would probably uh, react pretty quickly with lipids and other biomolecules in the immediate. Their lifetimes are very short, uh, so they don't last a long time. But I, you know, suppose if it was sprayed off or got into a droplet, potentially. Um, there's a lot of interesting chemistry about whether this stuff is the active form of TiO2. Um, you have to kind of test it to know. So I always use zinc oxide and it has the additional advantage if it does dissolve over time, TiO2 is totally persistent and zinc regenerates skin in some cases. Yep. Are there any special things that have to spray on? Um, <laughs> yeah. Like They've started to do these mists with TiO. Yeah, I'm, I'm amazed at that. And they're really convenient if you have kids, you just spray it on. But yeah. I, I haven't, we haven't tested the mists yet because they've just been on the market this year, but um, we would need more of an aerosol. We tend to typically look at application, not aerosolization. But I would think that would be an issue too because you could inhale. Most of the times those droplets are not nanoscale. They're going to be a little bit bigger because you, you sort of see, if you can see them with your eye, they're hundreds of microns. The question is, do they contain nanoscale particles that are getting delivered in some fashion? Yep. I don't really understand how the consumer can act as a decider. You can write letters to people or go visit Consumers Union, and which has got a. Uh, I mean, if it's in the products that are labeled, this, it's. Yeah, it's bad. I think they should be labeled. I think that we should know. You know, maybe you'll decide to use it because you've got a special risk of skin cancer. And these are really good at UVA blocking, but I agree. I think they should be labeled. But consumers are deciders in their inaction as much as in their action. So if consumers just don't care, aren't interested, then, you know, yeah. So have sunscreens always had zinc oxide? No. Dioxide last 20 years. It actually last five years, really. So they could go back to making sunscreen the way they used to make Absolutely, them. but they would be white. People don't like white. Okay. They argue that if, in fact, L'Oreal, I, I, I'll just a little story. So L'Oreal is a company I have a lot of interaction with. And they're acting like a petulant child now. So in Europe, there's a very strong force for labeling that's developing. And Laura, get this, here's their argument now. If you make us label, we're just not going to use nanotech in any of our products, and you guys are going to have to use white sunscreens. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's very petulant. It's like, where's the science? Where's the discussion about maybe we could label, you know? Yeah. That actually um, was another question I was going to ask, uh -huh. because it's my understanding the EPA has just ruled that they're going to regulate these based on the parent compound. Is that Yeah, I'm going to get, yeah, absolutely. Okay. How does this fit in with the European, um, the new, I'm drawing a complete blank on the name, but you have to prove that it's safe. Reach. Yeah, reach. So. REACH has got a very similar start. Let's, you're going to hear more from Andrew, I think, on regulation. And he's, more, he's better at talking about it than I am, I'm sure. This is the government as decider. And this is really the piece of it that I think is the worst for nanotechnology. Because whatever all of us say, we, we have some faith in our own governments. That's what regulation is about, to protect us, to get the information we don't have from industry to make decisions. OK, this is our government as decider. Uh, Nanomaterials are the same as their bulk materials for the purposes of EHS, which is problematic conceptually because why is there a $1 billion nanotechnology initiative if the materials are the same as the bulk? Why would we be using them in applications, right? It doesn't mean to say their biological properties could be different, but it, in any case, so this is the MSDS sheet, which is a sheet I get when I order chemicals. And this is actually for C60. And it says elemental carbon slash carbon black is a nuisance dust. So what's happening is they're taking whatever we know about bulk material, the big stuff that's not nano, and saying, OK, that holds for the small stuff. That has a very interesting effect on regulation. Because what it means 
is if you regulate, and in the TOSCA, the TOSCA, Toxic Substances Control Act, there's, there's two lines of regulation. One is the FDA and one is EPA. But TOSCA would really be the place that would control widespread use of the materials, especially for environmental introduction. The first question is, does the chemical fit TOSCA definition of a chemical substance? Well, yeah, nanomaterials are chemical substances. And then, is it excluded from TOSCA reporting, or is it in, basically is it on the list? If it's on the TOSCA inventory, and it's ranked as low, low effect, then boom, the company doesn't need to disclose it or do further testing. It just doesn't have to do anything. Now, the companies say they test it, but they don't have to provide that information to the public. So right now, the EPA, um, and it's spent a couple of years on this. Um, this is kind of a summary of it. It's has not treated the mere aggregation of molecules into particles or varying physical forms to result in different chemical substances. It's a long, long-winded answer for saying we don't think they're new chemicals. They're the same as the bulk chemical, um, and that has gone and pretty much meant that the chemical identity of a fullerene then. You can't enumerate it like you can all the thousands of polyaromatic hydrocarbons. I can draw a chemical formula for it at C60. It even has a CAS number, a chemical abstracts number, as a molecule. But for regular, regulatory purposes, it's considered carbon soot. So it's a little bit of a dissonance there. And um, I'm going to skip this. I have, a, I have a theory about what they should do. But the, the basic bottom line is of the 15 new nanoscale chemicals that were reported to the EPA because it was uncertain what was going to happen, the EPA found only one that might maybe have unique properties. But even then, it wasn't going to regulate it very heavily. The FDA has more or less followed suit. And the cosmetics industry is so not regulated that you know, you're going to get whatever you're going to get in a sunscreen or a foot powder or a deodorant. And I will tell you that those are the biggest markets right now for nanoscale materials. So it's a case-by-case -case area. And the hardest issue is that we have no access as consumers or even as scientists. That information is all confidential. So I don't even know what substances were reported and what the information was on it. So it's basically this, you know, nano is like bulk, but then nano really is different. Kind of both halves of the government talking. Um, and unfortunately, surprisingly enough, this is probably going to be what the EU does as well. The EU has a very strong, well-funded nanotech program that is driven out of their equivalent Department of Commerce. And in fact, the EU system has fairly weak regulatory agencies. So there's the tension that's a little bit more palatable over there. But I, I have found the EU, so the history of the EU is this. The EU at least the central, my sense of this is they have felt that reach, which is their very, you know, precautionary principle, no new chemical can come on the market without extensive testing kind of stuff, has cost them economically. And the countries are very aware of that. So the EU is kind of in this mode of, oh, we don't want to take any hits economically because of our overzealous public. And look what happened to us with the GMOs. And, and so they're actually more pro nanotech, I would say, than the US right now, at least at the central government level. Now, if you go to Germany, or you go to Switzerland, or you go to the UK, the national governments are very different. And that's a similar trend in this country. California, the city of Berkeley, is regulating nanomaterials. Cambridge, Massachusetts is likely to as well. You're finding state and local municipalities to be a lot more aggressive than the national government, because guess what? Who paid for nanotech? Not generally the state governments, although in some cases there's some exceptions. So um, you're finding that dynamic developing in an interesting way for nanotech. Uh, there's a lot. I sit on a National Academy panel now about research policy in the area, um, which is also very controversial. And that's a big topic right now on the Hill as the next NNI bill is going forward. Are we spending enough on research in this topical area for the risk? Is the research useful? And how do we create a research strategy? And the one that the government has prepared under the NNI is, frankly, kind of a mess. There's been a couple of hearings on it. Uh, the agencies are what we would call doing lip service to risk research, um, counting a lot of stuff as risk research that really isn't risk research. And it's a very interesting dynamic there, which might change with the new administration. I'm not sure. Uh, in any case, um, these sorts of who decides and how they're deciding, I called it the ugly, not so much because I totally disagree with all the decisions, but because it's far outside of my realm to understand what to do with it. 
it's putting the technical data in a larger context and all of the different forces that are shaping the decisions. And what I can say is that I have been surprised over the last five years, like with this latest asbestos report, how little the, you know, our agencies who would, for example, if a substance is like asbestos, even in the first or second test, you would expect a fair bit of activity in where is it used, how is it used, what are the respiratory controls, and there's been no response at all to that literature, um, to the surprise of most of us in the field right now. So maybe they will in the next six months or so do something, but it's a fairly pro-nanotech environment and most of the deciders are not willing to risk slowing down nanotechnology in any way, shape, or form because of their very fervent belief that it's necessary for us to maintain our economic competitiveness and solve some of these outstanding problems in the world. So that would be my, my sort of synopsis of it. I see the consumers' movement as an area where you will see some activity. It's already happening. And interestingly enough, the local municipalities and the role they're starting to play in these decision makings I have found also quite interesting, especially because I have a lot of friends at Berkeley in particular who are dealing with the Berkeley City Health Council <laughs> more than they're dealing with the US EPA. So um, I think I've said everything I wanted to say. I'm sorry that went over a bit. And uh, these are some discussion points, which I'm sure you have better ones. And I just have a lot of folks to thank. Um, and I'll be happy to chat more about this uh, if you want to. Thanks. So, questions? Start right away. Yes. Uh, what is your opinion with regards to the intellectual property issues? Like, we have lots of patents being filed yes. ever since 2004, ever since the industry started booming. And people just go in and file <coughs> the patents irrespective of whatever they, like, if it's got anything to do with nanoscale materials, the first thing they do is we need to file a yeah, patent. Yeah, incredibly broad claims, yeah. Yeah, take the issue of the carbon flaw nanotubes. We do have two companies, um, well, let me name them, IBM and NEC. They do hold the patents for these, and they are definitely going to have a big monopoly in the market. We know what's the potential these tubes have. So what is your opinion on it? What can wow. be done? And with the industry going to boom until 2015, this issue is going to be a big one, right? Yeah. So I'll make a couple of points about intellectual property. Um, the first point I'm going to make is that there are plenty of industries where intellectual property is not as valuable. So pick an industry where IP is incredibly important. Somebody tell me. Pharmaceutical. Pharmaceutical, right. Especially genes, because you can patent a gene. And then if you have a soybean that has that gene, you can go do a DNA analysis and boom, hey, there's my gene, give me money. So it's enforceable. So in biotech, intellectual property makes sense because it's an object, it's a thing, you can detect it. Now, in materials, generally, and in nano especially, um, name an industry where IP is actually not important, although it's a very high-tech industry. Software. Software? That's another one. Yeah, very, very good example where it's just gone open. You know? Another example is actually look at Intel and how the computer manufacturers are managing, right? They kind of pool their IP and they use it in a different way. It's not the secretive thing, because they can't enforce it. It just costs too much money in legal fees. It's not practical for that industry. So the question is, is nanotech going to be more like a biotech industry, which is very secretive, highly enforceable patents, or is it going to be end up kind of the way the computer, I would argue IT has ended up, which is the value of patents is less. It's not zero. It's just a very different world. I think it's going to be the latter because it's extremely hard to enforce patents. I'm actually involved in a patent, well, I'm not involved, I've been an, I'm an expert witness in one of the first nanotechnology patent wars. And it is in the late, we don't have standard definitions. We don't, the patent system in the US doesn't require a lot of peer review in putting in a patent or anywhere else in the world for that matter. So there's no, how do you, how do you say this person infringed on my patent? when basically the patents are, I made gobbledygook with boobadigalunk and you made, it, I mean, there's just nothing there, there to hang on to in most cases. The exception will be composition of matter patents, where somebody has tried to patent the molecular identity of a nanomaterial substance. And then I think you end up in a place the regulatory regulators end up in, and can you really patent something that's that big? You know, so, so my belief is that it's gonna be trade secrets, and it's gonna be, um, 
sharing, industry sharing of certain data and information, and that we're going to see as these patents become litigated, the first wave actually go to court, that it's very hard to defend the patents. And that's going to make a free for all. Why are the customers like that in terms of listening to one of the major scientists from the Stanford? Mm -hmm. And then what he said was like, uh, biotechnology had the ability to manipulate genes that led to the retaining of life. <coughs> And then he did a comparison of single scale <coughs> nanotech had, has the ability to manipulate molecules, which is definitely going to lead to the patenting of matter. Yeah, you can patent now what's called the composition of matter, which is I made A plus B plus C. It looks like this. It's mine. You can't make it. Okay. So you can those kinds of patents, if the substance can be analyzed, if you can prove it, like yes. You know, and there's been some excellent cases in the patent literature where that's been the case. I think maybe those will have some oomph. The process patents, which is, hey, I made my nanotubes via this pathway, and you're making, those are harder to litigate because you have to prove that, that your process is actually different enough, and you can just switch it up a little bit and argue, hey, it's different. Right, so, you're, so my sense is that you're gonna, you're, we're going to have to go through the next decade, and you're going to see a number of fairly high-profile patent lawsuits um, hit in areas that you might expect. But nanotech, nano is not bio. I mean, there is nanobio, okay? But it's not a gene that you can pull out of anything and go sequence. It's, it's stuff, and it's complicated stuff. And proving that your nanotube soup is the same as somebody else's is so hard. And I actually personally hope that it goes the way of software technology. I think the open source models really work better for academic creativity, and I think they will ultimately expand the field better. The other issue, of course, is that IP is one of the, if it does become a really strong hold on the, top, on the area, it's going to have really drastic impacts on how emerging countries adopt nanotech, because they have been so burned by GMOs and not owning those patents and you know, there's just a lot of bad blood there. So I'm hopeful that in the next decade we'll see the intellectual property and nanotech actually not play a very big <coughs> role and not carry a lot of value <coughs> to companies because it's not defensible. And if that happened, I think it would open it up. It would, it would flatten, level the playing field enough that we could introduce nanotechnology more successfully with the de into the developing world. Because right now it's like if some big company owns a patent, you know, that's just not, not a recipe for somebody and you name it to want to pick up a nanotechnology and try to use it. Yeah. Um, so given that the, the MSDS sheets, which is like what mm -hmm. chemists rely on for what company <coughs> is, that is showing that nanoparticles and I mean non-nanoparticles are the same, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, what role does, uh, so after all this research, isn't it almost futile, like the role of researchers in the whole policy making? I mean, I don't, I don't see any connect at all, because this is basic chemistry almost. Where yeah, it is kind of basic chemistry, isn't it? Yeah, it is amazing. Um, I have to believe, and I, I still am somewhat optimistic, so I think these things might take time. So I think eventually, if you look at history, sometimes the first response from an entrenched political system can change, and it can change for a whole bunch of reasons. And so I, I have great faith that this one will change when enough of these other actors have enough stake to make it change, right? If they don't know that they're using the materials and they don't think it's important, it's going to take their precious time to think about it. So I believe that the technical information will become useful, and I think there are definitely enough of a dialogue <coughs> that I'm seeing that you know, the government is getting criticized. There are non-governmentals who are using technical information in a relatively, you know, decent way to make the case. You see cities. Um, maybe that's what we're going to see, is that municipalities and states are the ones who hold the reins on this. And they're going to want the technical information about, you know, should we ban outright C60 in our district, or should we, if we're going to use it, is there a way to pre-treat it in our wastewater? I mean, I think, so I think the technical information will have an impact or I wouldn't be doing it. I just don't think it's going to be at the conventional national level. I think the national level may be very sort of, you know, not really do very much, at least for a little while. So I'm just curious, who makes the MSDS sheets? Is it like policy company? MSDS sheets are under overseen by OSHA, which is the, which is part of the NIOSH. And the, it's the Occupational Safety and Health Administration in this country. So it's really a workplace safety issue. It's not a legally binding document. So companies can say whatever they want. And they 
they do apparently. So it, it but it is the basis for thinking about how to how to do workplace controls. So um, one of the agencies that's been a little bit more proactive is OSHA, and they have some excellent guidance. I didn't do it for this group, but on workplace control, what you know, what respirators to use, what masks to use, what gloves. Don't vacuum up nanoparticles if you spill them, for example. <laughs> um, so they are trying to amass a body of information that can go to researchers using it. The difficulty is in the, is in the sort of value chain as business to business starts to sell. Because you know those sunscreen, those pigments in your sunscreen didn't get made by L'Oreal. They bought them from who knows where. Um, so that's really the connection is how do you get product information you know, not just out to the people working with it, but how do you codify it and get it transferred, not just from the person who makes it, the person who formulates it, the consumer who uses it, and what about the person who's running the waste incineration facility? You know, they just had a couple of tons of TI2 show up, it doesn't matter. So, so I think that's part of what there's a drive, not so much for labeling, the term that we're trying to use for it is product information to help you know, not go into that. But I, I think there's there's value in the technical information. You know, I'll give it another five years. <coughs> I'll decide if I can go do something else. Yes? I'm intrigued by the, the link between some nano, possibly between some nano parts and mesothelioma. Uh, asbestos is often held up as uh, one of the chief examples of sort of the market regulating itself. In other words, because uh, it was shown to be so dangerous and there's so much liability, it was removed from the market without much regulatory action. Yeah. Um, granted, a lot of people got very sick and that's obviously not yeah, good. Yeah, it's a latent, it's a chronic right, disease. Yeah. Exactly, but at least, I mean, now you, you can't build a building with asbestos and not so much because of regulation, but more because the company would be exposing itself to billions of dollars in lawsuits. So part of that, though, is due to the fact that there is a, a, a sickness that was directly traceable to asbestos exposure. What are, do you, do we know anything about uh, how, the, of the potential sicknesses that we're talking about with nanoparticles, how traceable they will be to specific nanotechnologies, or is that link not gonna be there, and therefore that possibility is, is it, of self-regulation isn't as uh, likely to occur? You raise an excellent point that I didn't bring up, which is the role of the insurance industry in litigation, especially in this society, as it's a global marketplace. The United States litigation system has a big impact, influence. A lot of insurance companies are watching extremely closely what's going on, and I've heard rumors that particularly the automotive industry has made decisions to take nanoparticles out of certain components on cars because their um, reinsurance companies, the ones above their insurance companies, didn't want them to do that because of these issues. I think that, that that's been held up as the way that nano is going to get regulated. Uh, is that the insurance industry is going to look at this and if they think something's bad is going to happen, they're going to make people not do it. And as you said, we saw how well that worked in asbestos. That might catch acute illnesses. Right. Illnesses where you get C60 and you get really sick. Okay, <coughs> it'll stop that. But these chronic diseases, and there's really three classes of chronic disease, all of which have some very severe <coughs> ramifications for the insurance industry because they've had experience with them. The first is the link with asbestos. So in my professional judgment, which is my own personal judgment, I believe within five to 10 years, there will be an established causal link between multi-wall nanotube exposure and, and mesothelioma. I think that's going to happen. It will be a particular class of nanotubes, not all of them, but that will, I believe that will happen. And I think the insurance industry is probably sees that too. Um, so there's that axis. <coughs> the other disease that has a smoking gun is the link to, this is much, much worse, is the link to Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, which are the presence of small metal particles in the brain. Uh, and the third is autoimmune diseases, which are all three of these diseases are chronic and would build up over time and would be caught quickly. Those are the ones that the insurance industry is really looking out on because they figure it's kind of brutal, but if it's gonna kill people right away, you'll find out about it. But if it's a latent 20 to 30 year exposure issue, you know, we won't know until the whole marketplace is using it. And so I, I think those are important issues. Will the insurance industry really flex its muscles? I think they will with Nan. I think they will eventually. The question is how big is the market before they do it? So is, is it is a very important issue. And the insurance company has been heavily involved with aspects of this debate. Uh -huh. I have to, the Alan's upstairs waiting for the biotechnology okay. to talk about sustainability. Great. But uh, thank you. Okay.